Hello everybody, so today I am doing another country thematic video. This time, oh boy, the country is China. So before I begin, let me just say this. Attention please. I'm only covering the Chinese stocks. This is how I want to classify them, right? I realize that maybe unwise, an unwise thing to do in my comment section, but Chinese stocks, they're a thing, they're available. We can buy them in the US. Some of them have good valuation. This is not a video about China. This is not a video about the Chinese leadership in any way. This is just a video about the stocks. I do not own any Chinese equities at the moment. I don't ever recommend any stock, no financial advice, no investment advice. I don't have anything against Chinese stocks. In fact, I used to own Alibaba and Tencent. I used to think they were very compelling stories, very much at the center of their marketplace. Unfortunately, they were quote-unquote dead money for years. So I sold them, didn't make a profit, didn't lose anything either. Uh, and I moved on to other stocks. Um, and lastly, you know, you can you can write, you know, in the comment section, uh, oh, I'll never own any Chinese stocks. And, and you can name, you can, you can point out a lot of reasons. I'm well aware of the risks of the ownership of ADRs, the delisting risks, the differences in accounting standards, you know, keep in mind that, you know, accounting issues, they, they happen in the U.S. very, 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 very commonly too. I just want to point that out, right? Uh, remember Enron, uh, you, you know, the whole available, and then in the banking sector, available for sale, held for L to maturity, SMCI, right? Some people are saying, I will never touch SMCI that I covered two days ago. I'll never touch it because of accounting. You know, keep that in mind. But if you don't like that, yeah, sure, don't, don't look at Chinese stocks. You know, the risks of management teams may be lying sometimes. These are all risks that happens in the US, that happens in China, that happens everywhere. These are the risks of investing. And risk, in my view, is okay if you're compensated for that risk. That's just my view. So let me get started with Chinese stocks. And notice I wrote dream evaluations. And that's specifically in reference to one stock that I found that is cheaper than hymns. So let me get started. And we really, it's it's a tale of two stories uh, for the Chinese stocks is, is you, you have a, kind of a legacy Chinese stock, Baba, Baidu, JD. They're a little, JD is a little younger, right? But Baba and Baidu are kind of the original 2000s. I mean, for Baba, it's the late 90s type Chinese stocks and you know it's low growth so I'll talk to this towards about these about the uh, I'll talk about these at the end of the video you'll see I'm not really interested I find them too expensive right now um and then there are the, the quicker growth uh perhaps more exciting new wave of Chinese stocks is what I'm gonna say so the first stock that I'm gonna talk about Remember my attention, please, quadrant about the accounting stands. I'm aware there was an accounting issue for Luckin Coffee, but they, they've they moved past that, I believe. But anyways, I don't know. I wouldn't know. But but to me, to me, they've moved past that. You know, the stock has languished a lot. Doesn't change the fact that the underlying business is Luckin Coffee, and it's, it's, it's a fairly successful business, and it's trading at an EV over GP over revenue growth of a 0.15% which would be in my cheapest. Tough to find any US data uh, about the future sales growth next 12 months. Keep in mind, they grew, they grew almost 40% of their revenue last year. The best I could find from an analyst in the US was 18%. I think they'll do more than that. I think they'll do quite a bit more than that. And then that would lead it as a 0.1. So again, you're getting into very, very uh, low valuations. If growth rate was higher, which it probably is, by the way, the rule of 40 will likely be achieved. What is luck in coffee, you may ask? Well, there's only one outside of China, and it's in Singapore. Um, so it's really something you can't have if you're if you're not if you're not in China. Right? It's in China. It's luck in coffee. It's this uh, blue coffee chain, and they are extremely successful in China. Twenty thousand stores think about how many stores that is that is just nuts insane crazy for a company whose enterprise value is six billion dollars 
six billion dollars. Do the math. Divide the number of stores, 20,000. Divide six billion by 20,000. You'll see how cheap that company is. And look at those numbers. Look at those metrics. Let me put it forward for looking coffee. The growth is stunning. Number of stores growing really, really fast. They're in 80 cities in China. And you know, small cities in China huge cities in the US and Europe, right? Um, 300 cities uh, in, in, their, in their partnership stores, which I assume is their franchise type of stuff, self-operated stores, 80 cities in China, one overseas, one overseas market, that's Singapore. Look at those, those numbers. Monthly transacting users, and so 69 million, right? But if, if, if accumulating, I'm just gonna read that, the accumulating transacting customers reach 278 million. 278 million customers. This is this this is more customers than there are adults in the in the USA. Like that's how big that is. The numbers, frankly, and you know, I don't own any Chinese stocks, but when I look at the numbers, it makes me love China and want to invest in China when I look at the numbers. So it's a, it's a it's a thriving customer out there. There's a thriving customer out there. There's a reason why. And by the way, I could I could have said that in the introduction. Right, Tesla was the first wholly owned factory in China. It was the Tesla Giga Shanghai factory, and so if you know if you know how important China is to Tesla, if we have if you have Tesla in your portfolio, you already have a lot of Chinese exposure. You know, I just want to point that out. They were able to 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 pierce through this this veil that didn't let the West in, and they let tesla in so you have you have some and i understand why so it's it's the, it's the biggest market for cars it's likely the biggest market for coffee it's likely the biggest market for luxury it's the biggest market for so many consumer goods as someone said the other day in my comment section uh if you lift out 800 million people out of poverty you must be doing something right the numbers are, are really what, what what gets me excited about china the, 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 those numbers of scale you know I, I like scale a lot and the scale in china to me is stunning um anyways let me move on to be widely talk about scale the the leader in hybrid electric vehicles is BYD. Yeah, sure, you know, if you follow Tesla, you know Tesla is better in pure EVs, like only the battery, Tesla is ahead. But if you look at the hybrids, if you look at manufacturing of batteries, if you look at the most compelling electric vehicles outside of Tesla, it's BYD, BYD, BYD. And BYD is very cheap at a 0.2. It is still growing very fast, 26% from this base, 86 billion, that's that's just a tad below Tesla, barely. Ba Tesla is at 96 billion, they're at 86 billion. But right now they're growing faster than Tesla, albeit with a lot of hybrids, albeit by being a supplier for a lot of batteries. But nonetheless, those numbers look good for a BYD. You know, to buy my exposure to this sector is too high by virtue of Tesla. But I understand why Charlie Munger used to love BYD. It's cheap. That's what Charlie Munger used to say. Charlie Munger used to be a big Chinese stock fan and used to say, you know, you got to go to China to find something cheap, you know, and, and he had a point. He had a point, I think. Now, the, the only company out of the six there, the only company that I would be considering buying, that I would consider buying, that's Pin Jojo. So Pin Jojo, there's no denying that they they innovated in a way that other companies did not innovate. And if you follow companies like Shine or Shein and Temu, Temu belongs to Pinjojo, then it's easy to understand that innovation. That innovation is in the in the name of the company Pinjojo. So so um, you know I, I I had seen different translation of Pinjojo. One of the translations that I have seen, I had seen was "shop with your friends for fun" or, or "have fun with your friends shopping." Right? Uh, the way Pinjodo translates is "together, savings and fun." All right. So, so, so they, they took the idea of a mall, right, from the 1990s. You know, in the U.S., the 90s. You know, teenagers would go to the mall and shopping. Yeah, it had a purpose, but it was also fun. Right, they took that idea to the extreme, and and they implemented gaming tactics to the shopping. 
to the point that, you know, I don't have the Temu app. I don't buy anything on these apps. But uh, when you go on Temu.com, which is the, the Western version, right, of, uh, of um, Pinjojo, the Western version, you see, you know, like, it's all about winning. So you play you play the wheel, you know, and it looks like I won $100 off. And But, of course, there's caveats, right? It's not really like you're getting $100 off. Uh, and, 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 and there's gaming throughout. You know, you can see in, in the back here, lightning deals. There's gaming throughout, gamification, gamification, gamification of shopping. It's you're, you're not really shopping for quality. You're shopping for fun. And, you know, this is what, you know, Pinjojo is under a lot of attack from European regulators, from US regulators saying, oh, the products are low quality. I think that's missing the point. Because people who buy on Temu, they don't buy for the quality. They buy for the thrill of it, the thrill of getting a good deal. That is an important social cultural innovation, in my view, in shopping. And I think it's a pretty innovative company. Now, of course, if you go read, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm you know, these, these, these stocks, like Pinjodo, that's what's called, called a battleground stock for a reason. Do any search for it and you feel like it's the end of the world. When I look at the numbers, I, I don't see that, right? When I look at the numbers from Pinjojo, you know, it's a 0.05 on enterprise value over gross profit, over revenue growth. How much am I paying for that growth? I'm paying a 0.05, which is cheaper than him's. If I'm willing to look at China, I just found a stock cheaper than him's. It's right there. Pinjojo, and it's a much bigger stock, and it's a much bigger scale. Now, of course, you have to be okay with all of my caveats that I said about Chinese stocks, but but frankly, this is a stock that I'm monitoring, and I wouldn't buy it at this level, but if everything you read about this stock is true, oh, it's going to drop, oh, it's the end of the world for Pinjojo, oh, these, these, these uh, Temu apps, they're going to be shut down, it's low quality, the regulators come in. If you, if you, if you start getting some of that uncertainty going on on the stock price you could get you could get a stock price that gets even cheaper than that and then what what do you do like let's say let's say the cost of pinjojo stock halves and now the ev over gp over rg to 0.025 or 0.023 what would i do looking at this stock right it might be be very juicy if that makes some sense rule of 40 also helps it's a 56 because of that high growth Okay, and EBITDA margin, these companies, as they scale, I'd like to look more into the numbers, but right now it's negative, but it, it, it doesn't have to be negative forever, right? It can go up, because look at the counterparts. Look, well, not exactly a counterpart, but look at look at the older players, like Alibaba. Alibaba is an older player. They are at 19% EBITDA margin. This is a company that's in full cash mode, cash-making mode, Alibaba. So Alibaba, of course, I would not own this stock because the growth is too small for me. At 6%, I can't do it. It's just too small. It's just too small. But Alibaba, I think what's very interesting about Alibaba is kind of a diversified play on AI um, outside of the US dominance in the field of AI. Alibaba Cloud, that's a big deal. It often comes up. If you look at any materials about, about Google, any materials about um, you know, NVIDIA, whether it's a competitor, it comes up as a competitor sometimes in competitive analysis, it comes up as a client on other times if you're looking at makers of IT equipment. And they have their own LLM that, that wins three out of the top 10 LLMs in China. That's from Alibaba. And uh, look at this. If you, if you, so the Quen, Quen is the name of their, their um, LLM. And they've deployed it across 90,000 enterprise in, enterprises in year one. So, so this is, um, you know, th this is a leading, a, a leading LLM. And it looks like Alibaba is getting, quote unquote, in line with what China wants. And that probably helps a lot in the adoption of the model. So, so I would, I would, I would, you know, put this stock on the radar again. I used to own it. I don't own it anymore. Maybe I would step back in. But the growth for me would have to be much higher. But if AI is there, the growth might be much higher. Okay, moving on to Baidu. Baidu is um, is the Google of China. Baidu also owns a, a video platform. It's, um, you know, they own a self-driving car division. 
I don't have much to say about Baidu. I mean, aside from the fact that the EBITDA margin is excellent, gross margin is good, but it's an expensive stock on my spreadsheet at a 0.94 on enterprise value of gross profit revenue growth. Why? Because the revenue growth is not there. And lastly, and this will be the same conclusion for JD, although even worse for JD, right? Baidu, I like less than Alibaba. JD, I like even less. Uh, you know, J J JD used to be praised many years back for for being this highly automated company and they had automation and automation was going to be a big thing for them and they were going to take market share and uh i mean i mean sure enough they seem to have a tremendous amount of success in china right 152 billion dollars in sales nothing to sneeze at but they've also reached their peak the revenue growth seems to only be four percent going forward gross margin is is very very low and so it beat the margin and so this is a stock that I would stay clear of. And the conclusion, and I'll conclude with this, is Pindrojo seems interesting. If it drops over the next few months, I might do a full analysis. This was it for this video. Remember, I do not own Chinese equities, and this was just talking about the stocks. So this is not investment advice, no financial advice, just entertainment. Please like. Please subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.